Mustafa, I want you to speak about the young generation, those who were mobilizing the demonstrations all over the, the Arab world, and they find themselves frustrated, marginal, marginalized, jobless, and with no hopes. How do you see the, the full picture of the young generation and the, the future which is expecting them? Sure, Smara, thank you. And let me try to speak out of the Turkish experience a little bit. Being a Turk, you know, not an Arab, so try to play that. I mean, how have the but Turkish try experience... To, try to add an overview on the Arab world, because sure. the, the, those people in the Arab world are seeing Turkey as a model. Exactly. Well, Turkey has been presented as a model for the Middle East for a long time, and I think model is a strong term, maybe a source of inspiration, might be a better term. But because of why, why Turkey is interesting, why if Turkey has a success story, where does it come from? Well, I'll come to your point on the young generation, how they feel in Turkey. But I think Turkey's success does not depend on a very strong excessive secularism, as people has claimed for a long time. It rather comes from a longer history with democracy. Because if there's a Turkish spring, it began as early as 1950, where we had the first free and fair elections. So Turkey's Islamists, which are to begin with more moderate, I mean, we don't have Salafis in Turkey, for example. The toughest Islamists would be the Muslim Brotherhood line. But even they have been engaging in democracy since 1950, so they made many trials and errors, and ultimately they learned better and better to be pragmatic, that's one thing. So I think Turkey's success story has a lot to do with its democratic experience. And secondly, especially in the past two, three decades, since the 80s with the Özal revolution, Özal was a very historic leader in Turkish history, which turned Turkey from a closed, protected economy to a market economy, and which initiated a new capitalist era in Turkish uh, politics and society, that created what some people call in Turkey the Islamic bourgeoisie or the Islamic Calvinists in you know, reference to Max Weber's theory on capitalism in, the, in Europe. And that has allowed in, in the past decade the rise of a new generation, which is Islamically pious, but which is not Islamist in an ideological sense, because which is engaged in business, which cares about the stock market, which doesn't imagine a utopian Islamist economy, but uh, it works within the real economy of the world. And that allowed the Justice and Development Party in Turkey to come to be and find a basis. We still have a lot of problems in Turkey when it comes to freedom of speech. Turkish democracy is far from being perfect and I can talk about them for another hour if you had time. But I think these are the two dynamics, democracy and the market economy. Because I think when we look at the Arab world, the Islamist versus secularist divide in most places, is also a class conflict. Islamists generally appealing to the more poor parts of society, more parochial parts of society. Islamists themselves might be engineers and educators and so on, but their power base is the downtrodden, and the secularists tend to be the more educated and generally well off and maybe more globalized. So the question is, if you raise an Islamically pious, believing, conservative generation, but which is also entrepreneurial and middle class, what happens? In Turkey, we see that that class tends to be still pious, still conservative, but much more pragmatic and leading to change. That's why Turkish soap operas, which are very successful, are now making sense to many Arab societies, because they see a, a more Muslim form of modernity in Turkey, in which you still have mosques and you know, conservative people, but you see a very you know, bo colorful uh, life. You see a shopping fest in Istanbul and in more consumer society. Uh, that's why, I mean, when I speak about moderation in the Middle East, my argument or my suggestion to Westerners or other people who uh, think about this is to say, well, first of all, do not support secular dictatorships, thinking that they will be helpful. They don't help, they actually create reactions in society, make the Islamists more strident and more radical, and we saw that vicious cycle in Egypt until today. Rather support democracy, allow the Islamists to participate. They will not be very liberal, but they will become more pragmatic over time, if they're allowed. The problem is that they were never allowed to be, do that in many countries. And secondly, if you want moderate regime, moderate Islamic attitudes, 
do not go and liberate countries by war, I would say like in Iraq, but support free market economics. I say make capitalism not war. You know, that's my situation based on the Turkish experience. And I agree with like, scholars like Veli Nasser in the sense that the change in the Middle East will come through mainly economic dynamics. And that's why you know, we should focus on how to build these societies, not oil money, but a bit of market economy, which makes ultimately people more pragmatic over time. That's what I see from a Turkish experience, and I think that's what is relevant for the Arab Spring and the generations of, new generations of the Arab Spring. Good, my time is over. Mayor, we got a little bit of answers diplomatic אז אולי אתה תכניס יותר בשר לניתוח שלך, שאני מבקשת ממך לעשות, איך בעיניים ישראליות, איך מהזווית שלנו נראה, איך נראית השכונה מסביב אחרי הטלטלה הגדולה שהיא עברה, ומה הסיכונים לגבי ישראל. סלחו לי שאני אפתח באמירה של... הנשיא שמעון פרס. הוא פעם אמר לי, אל תתנבל לעולם לטווחים קצרים, אלא מעל חמישים שנה ומעלה. We have to wait to our neighbors in Egypt. He said, you have to go to 50 years ahead. One day, one day, I'm not sure if anyone will remember in the next 50 years what you said. And if anyone will remember, you will probably not be in the same way to talk with him. I don't want to be able to wait. Everyone is trying to explain the truth as if it is one of the events that shows all the countries. אני מסכים שלוח הזמנים התחיל פחות או יותר באותו זמן, אבל כל מדינה עם המיוחדות שלה ועם הבעיות הפנימיות שלה, ואי אפשר להשוות את הבעיות במצרים לבעיות בסוריה, והבעיות בלוב לא דומות לבעיות בתימן, ואני חושב שהאירועים האלה הם עומדים בפני עצמם. אני חושב שכל אחד מיוחד במינו, אם הייתי מסתכל על השעה... הייתי מגדיר כך, אחד, בכל משטר שהייתה שאלה של לגיטימיות של השלטון, התנועה המהפכנית הפכה להיות אלימה והפעילה אלימות מזוינת כנגד המשטר, אנחנו רואים את זה באותם מקומות שהשלטון נתפס בכוח על ידי מנהיגים צבאיים, לעומת זאת, במדינות שבהן יש מלכים שהם היו תמיד פשרה של קואליציה בין משפחות חזקות ובין שבטים, אני לא חושב שישנה שאלה לגבי הלגיטימיות. מכנה משותף זה נוסף, זה התחיל באירועים של צעירים, שמאחר והם היו פחות מאורגנים ופחות אה, בעלי יכולת להתמודד באתגרים שהשלטון מציב להם, מהר מאוד האופוזיציות המאורגנות של ה... אסלאם הרדיקלי תפסו את, ה, נקרא לזה, את קרני המהפכה והתחילו להוביל את זה. אם אני אנתח את זה, ב, לפחות בקרבה של המדינות בסביבתנו, הייתי מגדיר שבסוריה המצב הוא מאבק בין המיעוט העלאווי השלט לבין הסונים. המאבק הזה איננו חדש, הוא מאבק ישן. הוא כבר הציג את עצמו בעבר מספר פעמים דרך הפיכות ומהפכות שקרו בסוריה ואני לא בטוח לגמרי מה תהיה התוצאה של העימות הזה. מבחינתנו כיהודים הייתי מגדיר שהייתי שמח שמי שמפעיל עוצמה וכוח כנגד אזרחים ורוצח אותם לא ראוי להיות שליט ולשבת במדינתו, במיוחד לנו כמדינה יהודית. אבל אי אפשר להיפטר ממנו גם, אם אתה מתכוון שאני... לנשיא סוריה. אני חושב שצריך להיפטר ממנו. הוא צריך לעזור לכל אחד שיעזור לעצמו וייפטר ממנו. אני חושב שמעבר לכך, בראייה הפוליטית 
אזורית, אני חושב שהליכתו של בשאר אסד תחליש ללא צורה משמעותית מאוד את ההשפעה האיראנית בקצה, תכרסם במעמדו ובכוחו של החיזבאללה ותאפשר אפילו אולי בלבנון להגיע למציאות פוליטית אחרת. אני מסכים למה שסלמן אמר שהתוצאות בסוריה יקרינו על הסביבה הקרובה. אם הייתי צריך להצביע איפה הם יקרינו הייתי אומר בלבנון שם תהיה ההקרנה הכי גדולה כי רמת ההשפעה ומעורבות הסורית בלבנון היא מאוד גבוהה אבל אין ספק שתהיה זליגה של הבעיה גם לתוך ירדן וגם למדינות אחרות. לגבי מצרים שריף דיבר הוא אמר שהמצב נזיל אני לא יודע להתנבא ותלוי מאוד מה, מה המועצה הצבאית תחליט שיהיו תוצאות הבחירות. זה לא פשוט, כי הבעיה היא לא רק ספירת קולות, היא לקבל את כל הערעורים, לספור. במצרים אני אגיד בעדינות שאף פעם לא היה חשוב איך הצביעו, היה חשוב מי ספר את הקולות. ולכן אני לא יודע בנקודת הזמן הזו מה יקרה במצרים. התופעה להערכתי עומד להימשך הרבה זמן. לצערי הרב הגורמים האסלאמיים השתלטו על חלק מהכתבת הסדר היום הלאומי בכל המדינות האלה ואני מודה שאני ברמה האישית בזווית הראייה הישראלית מוטרד כשמפלגות אסלאמיות בעלות אג'נדה אסלאמית רדיקלית יעלו למרכזי הכוח ויהפכו להיות הגורם השלטוני העיקרי. אני חושב שזה יציב לנו אתגר אזורי מאוד מאוד בעייתי, גם בהשלכות שלו לתוך חברה פלסטינית פנימה, גם ההשלכות האזוריות וגם מבחינת יצירת מכנה משותף אנטי ישראלי שהוא נראה לי בעיה קשה. אני דרך אגב לא אומר שזה עומד להתפתח לשם אבל אם זה יקרה הייתי מגדיר שזה איום לא פשוט. אני כן הייתי שמח לראות שהמשטרים יעלו באמת עם נטייה יותר דמוקרטית. עם... אבל זה משאלת לב, זה לא התוצאות. לגבי ירדן, אני חושב שכמו שנראה לי כרגע, הייתי אומר שהמלך עבדאללה עומד באתגר הזה בצורה לא רעה בכלל. אני חושב שהמערכת היחסים והדו-שיח של המשטר האשמי עם הירדנים היה תמיד הרבה יותר נקרא לזה פתוח ובדו שיח שמעולם לא הביא אותם לאיזו אלימות רדיקלית קיצונית ולכן אני מניח שבירדן השלטון ימצא את הדרך הנאותה כיצד ליישב את הרצון לרפורמות דבר שהוא אם ה... I will translate you later. Hebrew is very poetic. Nahti Arabi, okay. But I think that I am putting a broadcast on Egypt. I'm sorry that for me to speak in Jerusalem in English, it's a little bit problematic. You see the... You too. Okay. At least we feel at home here. It's about two Gentiles. Yeah. That's good. Dennis, I, I'm asking you to use ex, your expertise in the region and for an, an overview. Speaking of risks and opportunities, do you believe that this is high time for Israel to look into an opening and try to revive peace efforts or Israel should stay in the corner and wait until there is stability and the storm is over? Well, I think there's no such thing as waiting for stability. Uh, the idea that as, a, as someone who has a responsibility to make decisions here, you obviously have to be careful, thoughtful, 
and consider every step, but if you sit back, then the world will act on you. And what you don't want to do is be in a situation where your choices constantly shrink. The idea that Israel can, can lower its head and the storm will pass it by, it would be an illusion. So but if you look into the Israeli-Palestinian uh, non-dialogue for the la almost last two years, two sides are blaming each other that there is no serious partner. And uh, they prefer to still in Jerusalem and in Ramallah without communicating with each other. Status quo, on the other hand, uh, is very dangerous in the Middle East. Well, you're asking two different questions. You're asking one question as it relates to the Israelis and Palestinians, and you're asking another question as it relates to the region as a whole. We have to sit back and ask ourselves the question. The upheaval that we're seeing in the region is not related to the Palestinian issue. Uh, Mohammed Bouazizi did not set himself on fire because he was thinking about the Palestinians. The, uh, the Tahrir Square was not driven by the Palestinian issue. The uh, demonstrations that have produced a civil war in Syria were not driven by the Palestinian issue. So it isn't to say the Palestinian issue isn't an issue that matters. It certainly matters to Palestinians. It matters to Israelis. And I would say in the region as a whole, it is still a symbol that relates to a cause of justice. But what we're seeing is a reality where the relationship between ruler and ruled is being redefined in the region. If there's an issue of self-determination, it's self-determination for Egyptians so they will shape their own destiny within Egypt. The same in Tunisia, uh, the same in Syria. So the question is, number one, as Israel watches a storm around itself, what does it do? One thing it needs to do, I think, is think about, all right, if Turkey is a potential model for many in the region, primarily because Again, what's driving this? What's driving this has been a sense of indignity, injustice, a sense of exclusion, no possibility, no sense of an economic future. Uh, and suddenly people around the region look at Turkey and they say, well, here's a successful model economically. Why can't we have that as well? Now, there's an economic dimension, there's a political dimension. Those have to be developed and defined within each country. From an Israeli standpoint, as you're looking at the storm, one thing, with all the difficulties, and I don't minimize the difficulties, it's important to try to find a way to repair the relationship between uh, Israel and Turkey. That's not standing pat. Now, as it relates to the question of the Israelis and Palestinians, there's an entirely different reason. I would say there's two separate reasons for why Israel has an interest in seeing if there is something that can be done with Palestinians. One is entirely a function of Israel's own interests as it relates to the Prime Minister of Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who said uh, in the speech he gave a week before last, which I consider there were some very important statements that he made, one is he said it's, it's in Israel's strategic interest to make peace with Palestinians, meaning it's not a favor that we do to the Palestinians. Two, he, he said that Israel can't become a binational state. That again is Israel's interest. For those- So can you send him a message from here? A very short message. What? Is your piece of advice, what he should do? Well, I just gave it in the plenary. I have to repeat it all over again? Okay. This is a kind of, you know, look, my, my suggestion is to continue to try to pursue a political track because there always needs to be a political process. My concern is that any political process that get launched today, if tomorrow suddenly negotiations were resumed with great fanfare, is the Israeli public and the Palestinian public wouldn't believe in it. They have looked at the, they, they each have come to doubt whether the other is serious about a two-state approach. Palestinians believe Israelis will never really surrender control, and Israelis believe that Palestinians will never really accept uh, a real, genuine two-state solution. They look at, I think they, the mainstream in Israel looks at Palestinians and believes their definition of a two-state solution is a Palestinian state and a binational state. So what I'm suggesting at this point is that each side needs to think about the kinds of steps they could take to send a message to the, to the other that, no, actually, we do accept a two-state approach. Uh, and you take steps to reflect uh, that. While taking into consideration that each party has to think of his uh, political survival and, uh, and the price.